Good morning, everyone, and welcome to COVID Conversations with a Lawyer. I'm Philip Duggan, and I'm joined by Ryan Naidu, and together we are the hosts for today's webinar. We are very lucky to be joined today by our guest, Eugene Lim from WTS TechSize, who will be speaking on the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic on taxation law in Singapore. Eugene, the co-founder and principal of WTS TechSize, is an international tax and trade lawyer who works extensively in the Asia-Pacific region. He is a founding principal of TechSize Asia LLC, and his primary areas of practice include tax, both direct and indirect, and trade, mainly customs, export controls, trade sanctions, world trade organization, and free trade agreements. His work with clients involves advising them on strategic and high-end global value chain matters, as well as managing tax and trade controversies in the Asia-Pacific region. Eugene has also been recognized by leading legal directories, such as the Asia 500, uh, the Legal 500 Asia Pacific and International Tax Review. Previously, Eugene led Baker McKenzie's Singapore Tax, Trade and Wealth Management practice and chaired the firm's trade and commerce practice in the Asia Pacific. Following which, he took a two-year sabbatical and worked with various technology startups. Some of his work during the sabbatical included co-founding Privex, a MES licensed online digital private securities exchange, as well as Authors Online, a legal tax startup that seeks to provide law firms uh, with professional services and professional services firms with digital, digitally enabled practice infrastructure. Additionally, Eugene is currently on the board of a Tax Academy of Singapore, and he is the co-chair of a Tax and Trust Committee of the Law Society of Singapore. And with that, I'll let Ryan take us through the first question of a session. Thank you, Philip. And thank you, Eugene, for joining us today. So Eugene, as one of the leading practitioners for tax law in Singapore, could you perhaps start us off by telling us what exactly does a tax lawyer do? And perhaps given the COVID-19 theme of today's discussion, which are the areas that you think are particularly impacted by this pandemic? Uh, thanks, Ryan, and um, thank you, Philip and Ryan, for inviting me to the session this uh, today. And um, I guess just in terms of what tax lawyers do, I suppose we're a fairly rare breed in the Singapore legal fraternity. Um, it's it's um, it's not a area of practice which is um, uh, which you have in most firms. I think you have them in some firms. And uh, essentially, what uh, tax lawyers do actually, tax is a very very broad area of practice. So it involves, um, there, are, there are a few broad areas of practice. It could include advisory, planning, uh, and dispute resolution. So on the advisory side of um, the practice, is really providing clients with advice on how different areas of tax uh, or tax laws uh, affect their businesses. Uh, so it could be, for example, what are the, uh, whether you could take a deduction for some expenses or what is the, uh, uh, what is the, um, characterization of certain types of income and whether it's taxable in Singapore uh, or if there's cross-border payments, uh, what are the different types of withholding taxes that could apply and whether there are any kind of uh, tax treaties that could potentially reduce um, the, um, the instance of double taxation or reduce the, um, the, the, the rate of withholding tax that's applicable on the payments. Um, on the planning side of the practice, it's really looking at helping businesses um, achieve some of their business and financial goals in structuring. So for example, if you are looking at setting up a uh, company to hold investments in multiple jurisdictions, uh, which is the ideal holding company jurisdiction and looking at that from the perspective of, um, you know, what are the different types of um, cross-border payments? Are there different types of treaty uh, treaties that uh, could help uh, ensure that uh, income that's earned by the group is not double taxed. Uh, it could, well, moving on to the trade side of the house, we're really looking at also uh, if you've got investment treaties, uh, you know, that's the structure enable you to access uh, bilateral investment treaty provisions to protect your investments, especially in emerging markets. Um, and, and when you're looking at um, structuring, it's also looking at how do you ensure that uh, you have a sustainable structure, which on the one hand enables clients to uh, optimize their tax position, not only in Singapore, but in all the various countries where they have business operations, but at the same time uh, is sustainable from the perspective of 
uh, ensuring that you're able to defend the structure uh, in the event of a tax audit or when there's a dispute that arises with the tax authorities. Now, which brings me to the third area of practice, which is dispute resolution. Uh, and there, it, we are helping just clients deal with um, uh, explaining their tax issues to tax authorities, uh, not only in Singapore, but around the Asia Pacific region. Uh, so, uh, for example, recently we've been helping clients look at uh, potential tax dispute issues, not only in Singapore, but in the Philippines, uh, in Indonesia, in China, India, etc. Uh, but there is a Singapore angle to a lot of these dispute, uh, tax disputes, because if, for example, there is a tax treaty, often the tax treaties will include um, dispute resolution mechanisms, such as the mutual assistance uh, procedure, which enables uh, the taxpayers to um, you know, approach IRAS um, you know, and, and have IRAS engage in bilateral dispute resolution mechanisms with the tax authorities where the taxpayers have, um, have issues with. So that's uh, in a nutshell what tax lawyers do. Now coming to the um, COVID-19 theme, uh, when, when we look at COVID-19 from a tax perspective, uh, there, there are several areas which uh, you know, we look at. Uh, firstly, what are the uh, fiscal responses and stimuli, stimuli that have been announced by uh, the governments, not only in Singapore, but uh, really around the world, uh, governments have globally dipped into their treasuries uh, to support businesses during these exceptional times. Uh, secondly, because of the social uh, distancing rules and the travel restrictions, that has given rise to uh, certain unintended tax consequences. And uh, how do businesses and how do tax authorities deal with these unintended consequences and the different types of uh, measures they've uh, introduced to ameliorate uh, these, these um, uh, you know, the impact of the travel restrictions. Uh, thirdly, uh, we think that um, moving forwards is going to be, uh, it's really going to be governments trying to um, <clears throat> raise uh, revenue or collect revenue because of the great expense that they've all undertaken uh, in light of the COVID-19 um, sort of fiscal packages. So we think that really in the next step, in the next stage moving forwards, uh, clients will need to look at um, preparing for tax audits and more aggressive enforcement activities. And really that starts now with the need for businesses to properly document and prepare for the event uh, of, of such audits. So that in a nutshell is I think what, what will happen and uh, the COVID-19 angle to uh, tax practice. Excellent, thank you so much, Eugene. So. I believe the four main points you wish to address today are the, firstly, the fiscal responses and stimulus announced by the government. Secondly, the tax implications due to travel restrictions. Third, the need for businesses to document this impact of COVID-19 on their tax structures. And lastly, the preparation for the impending wave of tax audits and enforcement activities. Is that correct, Eugene? Uh, that's correct. Excellent. So now let's just get straight into this conversation and my next question for you is um, regarding the fiscal responses to the pandemic. So as you pointed out earlier, the government has rolled out a wide array of fiscal responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, which targets different groups of employers. So given that employers might not necessarily have the awareness or perhaps the savviness to navigate these schemes, could you shed some light on how these employers may go about seeking this relief that was meant to serve them. Sure, sure, Ryan. I think when we look at the uh, fiscal responses and uh, the, the, the stimulus package that's been introduced by the government, uh, there are really two aspects to it. Uh, the first aspect is um, the grants and the support measures that are given to businesses as a matter of course, uh, but uh, there are also various grant and support uh, measures that um, companies will need to apply for or to ensure that they qualify in the event that they don't receive the grant uh, appeal to the various authorities for support. So looking at, um, if, we, if we sort of look at the, the different regimes uh, from these two perspectives, um, if we look at, uh, for example, the different types of uh, support measures that come as a matter of course, uh, then 
with regard to the property tax rebates, regards to the job support scheme, uh, the JSS. I think these typically have been um, uh, these have been uh, ground measures that have been issued as a matter of course. And if you are a uh, business uh, that's operating in this particular environment, and depending on the type of industry that you're in, uh, you would qualify for different levels of support. And um, you know, speaking as a um, business owner um, and uh, you know, owner of a law firm, I think th these uh, support measures do uh, are very helpful in ensuring that um, you know companies manage costs during these very difficult times. Uh, but there are also other types of measures which um, companies need to look at to determine whether or not they qualify for, and if so, to ensure that they apply for uh, the relevant um, treatment. So, for example, you've got um, you know, loss carryback uh, schemes which have the, the, the period of time for the loss carryback has been extended. Uh, so if you've got losses this year and you've got profits in previous years, you do want to look at and speak to your tax advisor to see whether or not uh, you, know, you could apply the loss carryback rules to ensure that um, you know, the, um, the losses that, um, that um, you suffered this year uh, can be used to offset the profits and the tax that you've paid on profits in previous uh, years of assessment. <clears throat> now, there's also uh, rental waivers, uh, which again have been uh, quite useful. Uh, but uh, in many cases, I think the mechanics is that uh, companies will need to ensure that they satisfy conditions in order to qualify for the two month rental waiver. And to the extent that um, you know, the, uh, your landlords have not uh, approached you for the rental waivers, I think businesses will need to look at and speak to their landlords to see what they need to do to be able to qualify for these rental waivers. And often it will involve um, the landlord needing certain types of information from their tenants to ensure that they qualify under the various conditions for the grant of the rental waiver. Uh, there are also a lot of various other schemes like the SG United uh, traineeship program and the, and the recently announced job growth incentive. And there, if um, you are a business that's looking at hiring new staff, uh, certainly I think you want to look at uh, the SG United uh, traineeship program. Uh, also, there's a global readiness uh, traineeship uh, internship grant uh, and um, certainly the job growth incentive. And these are various support measures that you can apply to the government so that it helps defray uh, the cost of bringing about new headcount uh, during these difficult times. So back to you, um, Ryan. Uh, thank you so much, Eugene, for that really comprehensive coverage of the various schemes our government has rolled out. And I'm sure any business owners listening to this conversation will have a greater sense of clarity going forward. So now if we could move on to the, the second point you wish to address, given that Singapore is in fact a hub for international trade, how have the COVID-19 travel restrictions affected these international businesses? Sure. Um, so I think from a tax perspective, um, you know, often where your people are uh, has tax consequences. Uh, and we can look at it from two perspectives. I think one would be the uh, corporate tax residency, uh, residency status of companies. And secondly, um, from the perspective of permanent establishments. Now, when we look at uh, tax residency for companies, typically uh, the tax residency of a company is determined by the location where decisions are made. And uh, typically that's um, determined by where your board of directors meet and where you have board meetings. Uh, so in order, for example, for a company to have uh, a Singapore tax residency, you need to ensure that the board meets in Singapore and makes decisions in Singapore. Likewise, if you are a company that's not resident in Singapore, then you know, your board will typically need to meet in the, company where, uh, in the country where uh, the company is tax resident. Now that obviously in um, pre-COVID days means that uh, board members will need to travel to these various locations and hold board meetings to ensure that you've got the right, uh, to ensure that uh, you, know, you maintain your status as having tax residency in the proper country. Uh, now, <clears throat> in light of the travel restrictions, uh, then obviously you have difficulties with board members uh, making overseas trips uh, to ensure that they are in the right country when they hold board meetings. And so from a tax residency perspective, then that gives rise to questions as to whether or not or where uh, the company is tax resident in, 
and IRAS has um, an administrative concession at this point in time, uh, which uh, where company can still regard itself as being Singapore tax residents for the year of assessment 2021, if it's unable to hold a board of director uh, or board meetings here in Singapore due to travel restrictions. Right? Likewise, when we look at uh, permanent establishments, um, you really look at, you know, if a business um, has business operations in a foreign country, so outside the country where it's incorporated uh, or where it's tax resident, then the question is, you know, what does it do in that overseas country and whether it results in the company having a permanent resident or a permanent establishment in an overseas country or overseas location. Now, the, the test of permanent establishment is important because where you create a PE in a foreign country, then potentially that gives rise to taxing rights in the foreign country over the income that's earned by the business. So let's say, for example, um, I'm a, uh, I'm a uh, company that engages in the business of providing services. So let's say, um, let's say legal services, right? So now if, if I'm in Singapore and uh, I provide legal services and everyone's here in Singapore providing those services, I don't have uh, overseas branch, I don't have any kind of office overseas, uh, then you know, there's no PE outside Singapore, all my income therefore is taxed in Singapore or subject to the Singapore tax rules. But for example, if um, uh, my colleague, let's say, uh, my colleague Benedict, if he's, uh, if he was traveling uh, during the COVID-19, uh, you know, just before the pandemic and was stranded in some overseas location, or if, for example, if, uh, you know, he prefers to be in, uh, in an overseas location because of family, etc., and he's stuck there and unable to travel back to Singapore, then uh, there's a question as to whether or not, uh, by virtue of Benedict continuing to perform uh, his employment uh, activities in that foreign country, whether that gives rise to Singapore, my, my firm in Singapore having a permanent establishment overseas and subjecting a portion of the uh, income that's earned by uh, the law firm to tax in that foreign country. Now, um, and I guess you can appreciate that in this modern world, we do have a lot of uh, global executives that travel and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, as you recall, um, you know, really sort of um, took place just, uh, just prior to a big holiday season, the Chinese New Year, and where you know, a lot of executives and their families may have traveled back home, etc. cetera. Um, so from a Singapore perspective, again, IRAS has uh, come up with an administrative concession to say that unplanned presence of employees of foreign companies, uh, you know, that, um, that are in Singapore uh, due to travel restrictions will not result in those foreign companies having a permanent establishment in Singapore. And uh, there are certain conditions that need to be met, uh, but um, essentially IRAS has taken a, um, a very pragmatic approach uh, to ensuring that um, you know, companies do not have unintended tax consequences during this period of time. Now, again, there are similar types of um, um, concessions for individuals from an individual tax perspective, but certainly I think if you are a uh, if you are an individual or if you are a business with employees that are stuck in um, overseas locations or stuck in Singapore for foreign companies, uh, then you want to ensure that um, you consult these various rules to ensure that uh, you know you don't have any unintended uh, tax consequences during these times. Thank you, Eugene, for enlightening us on some of the unintended consequences of the travel restrictions on taxation. Um, so in our previous interactions, I, think you, I believe you mentioned that many international businesses actually practice transfer pricing to optimize their taxation model and maximize profitability. How exactly does transfer pricing do that? Yeah, I, I think um, transfer pricing at its very, very essence is basically the set of rules that determine uh, the uh, intercompany or intergroup prices of transactions between related parties. Right? So if you are a global multinational or global group of companies where you've got subsidiaries all over the world, then you, you will have a lot of intercompany transactions. 
And uh, the way in which the intercompany transactions are structured will also allow a, to a certain extent, allow companies to determine uh, how profits are allocated between the multinational uh, enterprise group. Now, <clears throat> I, I suppose uh, as, a, as a general uh, rule, uh, the transfer pricing uh, rules were meant to ensure that uh, there is proper allocation uh, and proper uh, principle approach to how you set these intercompany uh, transfer prices. And it's based on essentially the arm's length principle, whereby notwithstanding the fact that you're related parties, you need to treat uh, the related parties as if they were dealing on an arm's length basis and how the companies would transact with each other if they were unrelated parties transacting on arm's length. And the intention of the transfer pricing rules were actually to ensure exactly that we do not arrive at a situation where uh, multinational groups can manipulate the transfer prices to ensure that uh, you know, they, they shift the profit to uh, locations which are most advantageous to them from a tax perspective. Uh, but really, it seeks to ensure that there's proper allocation of uh, those profits. Uh, and certainly in today's uh, world, there's the mantra that uh, you need to have a uh, fair allocation of tax among the various countries where uh, a company operates. I won't go into the nitty gritty of the transfer pricing rules, but generally, when you look at the arm's length principle, uh, the way in which you look at setting the uh, transfer price or the intercompany uh, prices of transactions, is also really to look at risk and functions. So um, if you've got two related parties transacting with each other, you know, how are the risks and, uh, and functions of that particular business allocated between the two related parties? Um, which are the more risk-taking entrepreneurial functions the key functions, the key decision-making functions, which entity in the enterprise group actually performs those functions, uh, and also where are the people based, right? And, and you look at a whole range of factors to then set the intercompany price to ensure that, you know, the way in which you allocate the uh, profit in that business is uh, in a principled manner, in a manner which then complies with the uh, transfer pricing rules. Uh, now, the transfer pricing has, has um, you know, become a lot more visible uh, over the last few years, really because of you know, very high profile uh, cases involving large companies running into tax issues around the world. Uh, so certainly transfer pricing is increasingly an, a very, very important area for uh, businesses that operate uh, cross-border. Um, and it's certainly an area which uh, we will see a lot more controversy. So I guess uh, my advice to, to clients is if you're operating in multiple jurisdictions, you certainly want to ensure that you've got proper transfer pricing rules and policies in place uh, because in the long run that allows you to have a robust and sustainable structure moving forward. Thank you, Eugene. Um, given the importance of transfer pricing like you mentioned, it seems like the documentation of these transactions at an arm's length is an important practice. Is this documentation the same between different industries or are there different approaches taken within you know, each different industry? Yeah, I, I think from a documentation perspective, um, you know, there, there are numerous rules these days that companies will need to look at. Um, you know, certainly, I think if for multinationals or companies of a certain size, then they will need to look at whether or not uh, they're subject to uh, uh, you know, country by country reporting, uh, where they have master and local file requirements. And, and those, uh, those requirements are based on uh, OECD recommendations, uh, and that's been implemented fairly widely uh, around the world at this point in time. Uh, there are tweaks to the documentation requirements from country to country, uh, but certainly I think you'll see that um, documentation is going to be an increasing theme. Even in Singapore here, we, we too have, um, have uh, mandatory transfer pricing documentation requirements for companies that hit a certain size. Um, so you need to ensure that if you've crossed those thresholds, uh, you have the proper documentation in place to uh, document how you set 
Well, the document will basically show what are different types of intercompany transactions and how you arrived at the intercompany price. Uh, now, <clears throat> the, the transfer pricing documentation is important for various reasons. I think firstly, it forces companies to have a, um, a, a integrated and holistic view of how their intercompany transactions work and think through um, in a very systematic way how they set the prices uh, for these intercompany transactions and also from a broader perspective, from a tax structuring perspective, you know, how they allocate profits between different subsidiaries or related parties. Now, the, the type of TP document uh, will be fairly standard, especially where it's prescribed. So you will need to have certain types of transfer pricing documentation in place. But the, the, uh, the content of those documents and the transfer pricing uh, methodology that's adopted to set the transfer price will differ. So for example, if you're a trading company or if you're dealing with goods, uh, it's going to be very, very, it'll look very, very different from, for example, a financial services company, uh, you know, where you've got different centers looking to originate uh, financial instruments or loans, etc. right? So um, the content will look very different and the transfer pricing documentation will need to be tailored to the operations of each company and will need to speak to the uh, unique circumstances of the company and how they operate in their industries uh, and their tax strategies and document all that in the, in, in the transfer pricing document. So it isn't really a cut and paste type of uh, document. Uh, you can't download the precedent and change the names and voila, you've got transfer pricing documents. Uh, these need to be um, thought through very carefully and set out in a very strategic manner. Now in Singapore, uh, there are also various uh, advantages to having good transfer pricing documentation. Now the requirement is that you need to prepare and keep contemporaneous transfer pricing documentation. So these documents will need to be refreshed from time to time to ensure that they continue to reflect the actual business operations of the company. So I think sometimes what we've seen in the past is that uh, you know, a, a company has spent a lot of resources in preparing transfer pricing documentation, but that documentation is now a decade old. And when, when there is an audit, then what you find is that the content of that document doesn't really reflect how the business has evolved over the last 10 years, and therefore no longer is relevant to the type of business operations. So uh, therefore, there's a, there's a real need to ensure that you keep contemporaneous transfer pricing documentation. Now, what IRAS has said is that once you have uh, proper documents in place, uh, then that would also enable them to then um, allow the taxpayer to have access uh, to, for example, uh, mutual agreement procedures or, um, or advanced pricing arrangement uh, processes to ensure that um, you know, if companies need an APA or they want to access MAP, uh, where they need IRAS to support the taxpayer, then IRAS will really look at the quality of the transfer pricing documentation uh, in order to decide whether or not to grant taxpayers access to these different types of arrangements. So it is going to be very, very important moving forward. Not only is it important to ensure that you're compliant and you avoid penalties, but there are also advantages to having proper robust documentation in allowing you to access the different types of dispute resolution uh, mechanisms in, in uh, tax treaties. Thank you, Eugene, for that truly insightful bit about transfer pricing documentation. Um, given the current COVID-19 pandemic and all of the fiscal responses that we discussed earlier, you mentioned that there will be an increased enforcement, possibly in the form of things like audits. Um, what advice would you offer to business owners to prepare for this increased enforcement? Um, sure, Philip. <clears throat> I, I think when we look at... Um uh, enforcement, um, you know, I, I think it always starts first with ensuring that a business is in full compliance. You know, I think ensuring that your house is in order puts you in a good position to deal with an audit, uh, as opposed to, you know, having uh, your, your house being in a messy state and then having the authorities knock on your door. And at that point in time, I think it becomes a lot more difficult 
to do an audit. Now, I, I will say that, um, you know, we've looked at transfer pricing, we looked at the tax perspectives uh, to transfer pricing, but, um, you know, transfer pricing uh, can often have other, uh, touch on other areas uh, of, of um, taxation as well. So, for example, if you are dealing with, um, you know, the cross-border supply of goods among, inter, uh, in, among multinational groups or related party groups, then you need to ensure that the transfer pricing also complies with the customs valuation rules in the various countries, uh, because there again, you've got a different set of rules that try to ensure that there is some form of fairness in how uh, related party transactions are set, uh, because from a customs perspective, they would be looking to ensuring that they collect the appropriate amount of customs duties and import GST or VAT. Now, uh, coming back to the question of audits. So when we look at, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, governments around the world have spent a lot of money. They've dug deep into their coffers and reserves to ensure that they continue to support businesses and their citizens during these very, very difficult times. Uh, now, um, the time of reckoning will arise when uh, the governments will then need to um, I guess, collect revenue uh, to be able to restore uh, their reserves, uh, replenish their reserves, uh, replenish their coffers. And um, the way in which governments um, raise revenue is by raising taxes. And uh, you can do that either by increasing the rate or by auditing taxpayers to ensure they're in full compliance with the rules. Uh, now, increasing the rates can be politically sensitive, and in many countries, it's really, really difficult to increase the rate of taxation. Um, so uh, as an alternative to increasing rates, you look at audits. Now, when, when you look at uh, preparing for an audit, uh, really it involves ensuring that, um, you know, that the company has reviewed its operations and its tax compliance, its tax returns, how it's, it's filing its tax returns uh, to ensure that, um, you know, to ensure that um, they have um, complied with the different rules. Now, where they've done, um, where they've looked at their existing operations and realized that they have, shall we say, skeletons in the closet or where there are instances of non-compliance, really then they need to think about remediation. And uh, generally, you're in a much better uh, position where you've found the issue and remediated the issue and gone to the tax authorities to uh, plead your case, either by way of voluntary disclosures or disclosures of certain forms, rather than having those issues come to light in an audit. So I think those are some of the things that uh, companies will need to look at at this point in time uh, to prepare for the, what we think will be an impending wall of audits in the, um, in the short medium term. Thank you, Eugene, for some truly insightful inputs regarding the implications of this pandemic in the realm of taxation law. Um, perhaps before we conclude this session, could we just ask you one more question regarding the state of taxation law acclimatizing to the new normal? So I think in particular, seeing how the COVID-19 pandemic has drastically changed the commercial landscape, uh, how do you see taxation law changing to accommodate these quickly changing commercial landscapes? Uh, well, I, I think, you know, when we look at uh, international tax, I, I think there were various um, truly seismic developments which were taking place pre-COVID-19. Um, and, um, you know, we saw uh, the, uh, the BEPS project or the Base Erosion Profit Shifting Project uh, embarked by OECD in 2015-2016. Um, and, um, and that project has actually moved on uh, under the rubric of digital taxation or BEPS 2.0. We're looking at, uh, you know, looking at a new set of international tax rules to tax multinationals and how they operate, and certainly with a, a key focus on uh, digital services and uh, digital companies, technology companies, which have the ability to, uh, um, to engage in businesses globally without necessarily having a business presence in the countries where they have business operations. Right? So from that perspective, um, you know, certainly COVID-19 and the new norm, COVID-19 has forced all of us to be brutally digital. Uh, so the fact that we're having a webinar as opposed to an in-person 
seminar, I think that speaks to the type of um, uh, digital advances that have taken place in the relatively short period of time of the uh, duration of the pandemic. And I think that will just continue to grow. Um, and if you look at um, uh, you know, digital services, uh, digital businesses, uh, and that, that I think is going to be, and has been, uh, and continues to be the new frontier. Uh, and we see the ability for companies to scale up and scale across jurisdictions, across businesses, uh, with, with really just through uh, no more than potentially a website, uh, which could be hosted here in Singapore or somewhere else in the world. Uh, and, you, and, and you have the ability to reach consumers in, in uh, a lot of different countries. Now, I think in that, from that perspective, uh, then in the new norm, with these new rules coming into play, I think businesses will need to ensure that um, they comply with these new set of rules. And we are starting to see, even in this duration, uh, countries in Asia introduce new uh, taxes on digital services um, as they look to new avenues to raise tax. So, for example, the Philippines, Indonesia, India, and Thailand and Vietnam, they're all looking at, you know, how do they change their existing rules to better tax digital services and digital companies. Now, Although it applies mainly to digital companies, I think it's setting really a new infrastructure to tax cross-border businesses. And so even if you're not in the high tech industry and you're in perhaps normal tech or old tech, um, you certainly do want to look at these rules to ensure that um, you know, uh, you're looking at um, how you comply with these new set of complex rules. Now, the, the second, I think, big development uh, over the last uh, few years has really been the uh, US-China trade tensions. And that will continue to shape, I think, a lot of international businesses, whether you are US or Chinese headquartered. Um, so I think in the past, the US-China corridor was a very, very important uh, corridor for international business flows. And I think that, um, well, I guess, depending on how the US elections pan out in November, um, I think, you know, you've seen a lot of rules over the last year that reflect tension between these two economic superpowers that affect the flow of trade and commerce between the US and China. Now what that means is that a lot of companies, regardless of your nationality, will need to uh, react to these developments. And what we've seen is that um, now you have companies that are looking at a non-US, non-China supply chain, or looking at ensuring that they've got businesses that continue to be robust um, and uh, ensure that they're not caught uh, in, the, um, uh, in, the, um, in the conflict between the US and China. Um, so all that will require a lot of rethinking on structure, uh, rethinking of how you conduct your business operations. You need to be more resilient and uh, agile. So ensuring that you have the ability to change your business processes and business operations, but at the same time, also ensuring that you're resilient enough to cope with the new rules and also with further disruptions that come about because of these tensions or because of you know, further tra travel restrictions uh, due to COVID-19 or future um, pandemics or environmental uh, disasters. So I think that agility and the resilience now needs to be built into a lot of business operations. And with that, then obviously, the, um, the tax consequence will need to be re-examined. So whatever you've understood to be the norm in the past, that needs to be re-examined and you need to ensure that you continue to, be, um, to have a, 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 um, a tax structure, a tax strategy that is relevant to the, um, the new norm. All right, thank you, Eugene. I, I think this will certainly be an interesting period for us all, seeing how the commercial practice will try and adapt to an increasingly digitized world and also seeing how firms will navigate through these unique political circumstances in current times. But that's enough time we have for today. And just like that, our time spent has really flown by in an instant, but it's certainly been productive. I'm sure all of you would agree. So on behalf of NUS and COVID, we would like to thank you and express our gratitude to you, Eugene, as well as Benedict and WTS Tax Size for your contributions to this session and your guidance over the entire course of this project.
COVID would not have been possible without you. Lastly, for those of you who have tuned into this webinar, do feel free to explore the effects of this pandemic on other areas of practice as well, either in the form of webinars such as this one or via academic articles written by some of our faculty's very own. Advice on navigating COVID-19 legislation, as well as the various government grants, can also be found on our website, www.nus-covid.com, which provides a one-stop solution for legal clarity on everything COVID-19 related. And once again, thank you all so much for tuning in, and we hope you found this session helpful. Wherever this finds you, have a good day.